Did Swedenborg have any dialogue with Jesus? Did the angels help us find and connect with our soulmate? Does Swedenborg mention suicide? Will we be able to see God when we pass God away? God is omniscient, and why would How he can allow someone you? gain heavenly the rewards? Afterlife. Is the afterlife more lined up? God is the source of life. I wonder if angels are the source of hell. Does Swedenborg tell us anything about our spirit? Is there any particular? Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Swedenborg in Life. It's our 10 questions show. I'm Curtis Childs and I'll be the host. And what we're going to do today is take your questions that you've asked us and dig in and see if we can get some good answers. We're going to take a look at psychology, theology, just how to get through life and everything in between. Some new faces, some faces you already know. So thanks so much for asking. Here's our best shot at providing you with some answers. Goldie asked, if it's the Lord's desire for all of us to be saved and happy forever, how does that work with the inner nature in all of us that Swedenborg says cannot be changed? We are the same forever. I read this question as, will I be stuck forever at the same level of spiritual development that I managed to reach by the time I die? Which would be a very scary thought for me. Let's look at an example sentence from Swedenborg that might stir up this question. In Arcana Celestia, he says, a person's life cannot be changed after death. It then remains the same as what it had been before. And this echoes an image in Ecclesiastes about where a tree falls, it lies, and similar concepts in other traditions. But Swedenborg identifies what he means by a person's life. Love is our life, he says in Divine Love and Wisdom, number one. So love is what we care about and enjoy. Our life is what we care about the most. During our time on earth, We'll have a mixture of things that we care about, some healthy, some unhealthy. But the key is, what do we end up caring about the most by the time Earth life is over? After death, we can't change what we care about the most because we have built our spirit out of that. That's the science of how our spirits get formed. But this doesn't mean that we have to be all finished becoming good and heavenly by the time earthly life ends. Not at all. What it means is, we have to use earth life to develop a very basic willingness for heaven instead of hell. So how do we do that? And how do we know if we've accomplished what we need to accomplish on earth before we cross over? One way to think about it is to keep in mind two basic elements of life. Conscience and usefulness. Conscience is a tool to develop a crucial basic willingness to resist hell. A conscience identifies a basic sense of right and wrong and an inner willingness to resist what is wrong and harmful. Swedenborg learned that it doesn't even matter if a person's principles of right and wrong aren't accurate. The crucial thing is to use conscience to develop a willingness to resist harmfulness. That Then, when we cross over, that willingness will allow the Lord to keep working with us. Here's a quote from Swedenborg's Journal of Spiritual Experiences about conscience. He'll mention marriage love in here, and keep in mind that marriage love is a very expansive love coming from God about the faithful union of love and wisdom, kindness and faith in all aspects of life, including, yes, the element of a faithful love commitment between two people. So he wrote, Those who have a conscience can be improved in the other life. I was told and also realized that those involved in fantasies and in falsities, provided they have kept marriage love holy and have had a conscience, especially in that respect, can be improved in the other life, even though they might have been obstinate or might have stuck obstinately to their own opinions and falsities. But those, on the other hand, who did not have a conscience, especially those who had considered adulteries as nothing, and in other matters during their life had acted in a criminal matter without conscience. Their life appears in the other life as if without restraint, thus without any connection with heaven. Those having no conscience in regard to adulteries are, so to speak, bereft of every bond. These are the ones who cannot be improved so as to be able to come among the heavenly except as beings scarcely conscious of themselves." So yes, there's a warning there at the end, which I think is why Swedenborg sometimes comes on kind of strong about how we have to make effort while in this world. 
we know we couldn't spend decades eating only junk food and then expect that magically our bodies can still function well. Similarly, we have to make effort during earthly life to develop a spirit that is healthy and functional. I've read a lot in spiritual experiences about complex processes in the afterlife, kind of like medical procedures for purging evil out of people in hell so that they don't completely extinguish themselves, but because they didn't develop any conscious willingness for goodness, there's no healthy individual awareness in there to expand. But focus on that important message that our flaws will not remain with us forever if only we have developed a basic conscience and acted on it. A basic conscience allows us to be improved forever. And then there's usefulness. Swedenborg ongoingly reports this, this fact about heaven that I'll quote from Arcana Celestia. The Lord's kingdom is nothing else than a kingdom of useful services. So conscience is a willingness to resist hell. Any willingness to be useful beyond just ourselves is a willingness to be a part of heaven. Goodwill and mutual love are what heaven are all about, but it's sometimes hard to feel loving towards others while on earth. And yet developing a willingness to be somehow useful to a greater good, whether that greater good is kindness and support towards just a few people, or a positive difference our job is making, or a vast effort to improve lives all around the world, any of those goals hold within them love and goodwill towards others, whether we feel it or not. So a willingness to be useful is, in the end, a willingness to be a part of heaven. So when thinking of what we need to accomplish while on earth, before we die, remember these two things, conscience, usefulness. If we develop a basic willingness for those two things, the Lord can keep improving our hearts and minds in the afterlife forever. So Joe asks, how old is Swedenborg when his visions started? So I wanna bring you through a few things that I thought are really cool, but before I do that, I just wanna give a shout out to this book because this book is epic. Um, in it, we have tons of letters that Swedenborg writes about the nature of his spiritual experiences, and also it includes letters that his friends wrote uh, vouching for Swedenborg and his credibility. So we have tons of things in here that really shine a light on who Swedenborg was. This is called Documents Concerning Swedenborg. So if you, if you wanna check it out, I highly recommend it. Uh, so let's go right into it. Uh, so Swedenborg was born to be a pretty spiritual little kid, and it's pretty wild to read about it. I wanna give you a quote here from this book. It says this, my fourth to my 10th year, my thoughts were constantly engaged and thought about God on salvation and on the spiritual affections of man. And several times I revealed things at which my father and mother wondered and made them declare at times that certainly the angels spoke through my mouth. So here we have, just in context leading up to his big spiritual awakening as an adult, we have, as a small child, someone that obviously has some gifts and even to the extent that his parents are wondering what's going on here. So pretty cool stuff. So I wanna bring us all the way to his age 55. So this is after he, or even in the midst of his big scientific career, he's starting to experience some really strange shifts. And there's two stories that I think are really powerful that shed light on what's about to happen and how his visions will start to come more and more frequently. So 1743, we have his diary of dreams. And this is a, it starts out like a diary, uh, maybe like a lot of us have, where we're, if we're on vacation or we're just going to a new place, we're recording what we're seeing, what we're feeling. Um, oh, that, that castle looks pretty cool, sweet. But about a quarter way through the diary of dreams, he starts to shift things around and starts to record these really strange and vivid dreams in which he's experiencing really, uh, just really odd stuff. And this starts to, it starts to shake the foundation of his life. He, re he records this experience in this diary in 1744. So he's sleeping and he, he awakes with this thunderous loud clap and he is thrown from his bed and he's prostrated on the ground. And so he has his hands and his feet on the ground and he is so afraid of what's about to happen. He actually begins this diary entry uh, before this even happens saying, not good, not good, not good. Three times. He's obviously feeling anxiety about something. 
And this is confirmed when he's thrown to his, to his feet, to his hands, and he's just, he's laying there praying because this loud thunderous noise is freaking him out in his room. And as he prays, he feels actually a third hand grasping his hands together. And he looks up. And you know what he sees? He sees Christ. This is one of the first visions he has of the Lord. And the Lord lifts him over to him and he's actually staring face to face with Christ. And he says, uh, Christ asked Swedenborg one thing, and it's really strange. Do you have a clean bill of health? And so that, when you read that off the set, it's like, what? That's, of all the things, this epic moment of Swedenborg's life, he gets asked that. But let's spin it for a second. This is a pretty profound spiritual experience. He's looking at the Lord, and the Lord's actually smiling back at him. And I think this question is more evocative of, do you have a strong faith? Is your faith, is your spirituality healthy? So it's not as much a natural health as it is a spiritual one. And Swedenborg replies, uh, Lord, only you know. And so I'm going to leave that experience there. I'm going to put that down for a second because I want to share with you probably the pivotal moment of Swedenborg's life that brought him into this full state of having visions. So he's at a pub in London, uh, my man. And he is sitting in a private room, and he's enjoying this rather fine meal. And this is uh, at age 57. I just want to give you some context here. And all of a sudden, he writes uh, that the room shifted character. And he saw at the end of the table what appeared to be either a man or an angel or something strange, and it was kind of shadowy. And that this, this experience, he's asked by this shadowy figure, Emmanuel, eat not so much. Yet yeah, again, another strange thing. And as he says that, he starts to see a vapor coming. Swedenborg sa says he sees a vapor coming off his body. It, it, it emits onto the ground, and a, that vapor turns into strange and disgusting creatures. So like snakes, venomous creatures, just amphibious things, and they're covering the floor. And then he says that all of a sudden they, they start to hiss, and then pop, and it's back to normal. And so this is a very strange experience. Um, Swedenborg is freaked out. And so he gets out of this pub. He's like, listen, this is the last time I'm coming here. He probably didn't tip anyone. He ran home and his landlord, as he gets home, actually accounts about Swedenborg appearing really disheveled. And uh, Swedenborg sprints up to his room and he's like, oh my gosh. And what happens then? Well, actually the same figure appears to Swedenborg and, and Swedenborg realizes that this is the Lord. And that night, that very night, the spiritual world was opened up fully to Swedenborg. And that, my friends, is the first time that Swedenborg truly uh, began this next stage of life. And this is when his visions became more frequent and he became fully a servant of the Lord, writing all these amazing books. So hopefully, Joe, that helps you out. Uh, this was an awesome thing to study and I hope I can uh, Hope that was of service to you all. Thanks. We have a question here from a person named Introvertent. The question is, can evil spirits act through people, psychopaths, for instance, those who seek to intentionally harm us? Well, I kind of like to unpack that question by looking at two or three different key terms that the person used. One is, what is a psychopath? So as a psychologist, I'm going to talk about that. What, what are some of the behaviors and attitudes people have if we consider them psychopaths? Another one is the issue of evil. And that's from a Swedenborgian point of view. What do we mean by evil spirits and how do they have influence on who we are? The other one that's a key word in this question is the word intent or intentionality. So let's first talk about psychopaths. Psychopaths is a term that is not used by all psychologists, but those that do use it, they, they've come up with a list of different behaviors and different attitudes that are often seen. So some of the, the behaviors and attitudes that we see in psychopaths are that they are uh, rather glib. And a glib means a person who is probably not telling the truth and they're coming across as rather shallow and impulsive and, and we don't quite trust them. Another thing along the same line is that the person might be very impulsive in their actions and their behavior. They may uh, do whatever they feel like at the moment, regardless of the law, regardless of what effect they're having on other people. 
And because of that, they may have had a history all the way through their adolescence of being a juvenile delinquent. They may have done all kinds of deviant behaviors, not just breaking the law. They may have just breaking the social norms, saying things that are unusual or cruel, and then laughing about it. They may be deceitful. In fact, their lies may be inconsistent. They may not be very good at keeping up with their own lies. But when we see somebody that we really can't trust very much, it's not unusual that this is one part of the pattern of psychop uh, psychopathy. Another is that they're rather irresponsible for their behavior. So if they have a tendency to um, steal or lie or even rape somebody, they don't seem to have a regard for whether or not this person is in pain or has suffered because of their actions. And they don't show much empathy. They really don't seem to have much empathy and they don't even fake it. Unfortunately, with all of these negative behaviors, they also can sometimes be quite charming and very um, alluring and people who you might have fun with. But unfortunately, very often they're pulling others in uh, to kind of um, get them into trouble or to cause harm. And, and the more they're planning it, the more they're responsible for it, according to Swedenborg. Now, another term that psychologists use in addition to psychop psychopathy or psychopaths is a phrase called antisocial personality disorder. That's a term that's more often used by uh, professional psychologists. Anyway, so let's switch to a Swedenborgian point of view. If, if you are talking about evil, I want to be very cautious to not make a spiritual judgment about any one individual, even though psychologists evaluate psychopaths and they diagnose them and they define their personality uh, according to these patterns. I want to be careful that we don't cross the line and start deciding whether somebody's going to hell. But let's talk about what Swedenborg says uh, are generalities. And one is that according to Swedenborg, uh, I'm going to give a quote here from Apocalypse Explained. It is from hell that murder itself proceeds. So let's talk about those, that word proceed. It, it really implies that hellish ideas or evil ideas come from the source and that is the hells. So it's like an influence that's coming in. Just like we have influences from the heavens, we have influences coming from hells. And we as individuals are responsible for receiving this. And we may take influences from both the heavens and the hells and we may distort them with our falsities or trying to satisfy our own love of self and our own love of the world. Um, and if a person is having intent to do harm, that means they're premeditating, they're thinking about it ahead of time and therefore probably more receptive to the influences from the hells. Now, another is that uh, typically a person who is really in a long-term pattern of enjoying to, uh, doing hellish things or destructive things to others and really hurting others and seem to take delight in it. Swedenborg tells us that we are held more responsible for actions if our basically our mind is working at a full function and if we love doing it. So it's in our intellect and our will. And the smarter we are, and the more we really understand what we're doing and the effect that we, our behavior has on others, the more we are really responsible. In Kinduja Love, it talks about how there's different levels of responsibility. If a person is, um, imagine somebody who's part of a family, like let's say an organized crime family, or they're part of a gang, and they just follow along, it's really not the individual's responsibility if they're just following along out of fear. They just do the bad things. They, they do the crimes just because they have to. And they're not really thinking through what they're doing. The Lord is very merciful for somebody who's of, of lower intelligence and is just really almost childlike. But if a person is really mature enough to be able to know what they're doing, they're thinking about it, they're intending to do it, and then afterwards they relish the idea that they harmed somebody, they stole, or they manipulated somebody, or they they um, they uh, killed somebody that was their enemy. And if they really enjoy that, then their will is involved. And they not only intended to do it, but afterwards they have no remorse and they are really... Um, relishing the idea that they got away with it. The Lord holds them far more responsible. And uh, according to Heaven and Hell 591, evil is constantly emanating from hell. So it's almost like there's this constant wind of bad ideas, but it's 
we are the receptacles and we get to decide whether or not we uh, will receive those. So in summary, the evil spirits do influence us and we can decide whether or not to be receptacles of it. The Lord also is always sending positive influences to us, all goodness and all truth. But if we choose to distort it or just tune it out and don't care about the Lord and care much more about ourselves and our worldly possessions, the more mature we are, the more we're responsible for that. Lily asks, how do you connect with the Lord when you don't feel he is winning and your mind and your ego tells you hell is stronger? So this question really resonated with me because it's about the feeling of despair and these really tough places that we get into in life. And I would love to be able to just pick you out of it, pick people out of it, have people get me out of it when I'm in it, but, but it's not that easy to dispel. So I, I can't banish it, but I'm hoping that I can offer a couple of tools here that will hopefully take the edge off it when you are in a state like this. So the first tool I wanna offer is the, the concept that just because you feel like this, it isn't an indicator that something is wrong. I don't know about you, but like, you know, if I get hurt, part of the worry is, oh, is my body damaged at the same time? It's not just the pain, it's the, the, the fear of damage. And I feel like in these despair situations, it's, this feels really bad. I feel like I'm alone. I feel like uh, there's no help out me for there, or <laughs> no help for me out there. And I'm also worried that because I feel like this, maybe those negative thoughts are true, or maybe my connection with God is off, or maybe God doesn't exist, because if I was all the way plugged in and spiritually healthy, I wouldn't feel like this, right? So isn't this state an indicator that something is wrong? And I'm saying it's not, because we go in cycles. You know, it's not light all the time. It gets dark for about half of the 24 hour period every every day. Swedenborg describes a day-night cycle even in spiritual things. And it sounds like what you're describing is spiritual night. And that when, when the light is dim and, and it's not as hot, when it just feels like there's nothing comforting there. And he talks about how we actually perceive God and the true and good things differently depending on which state we're in. And, and it's a correspondence with the sun and the moon. And when the sun is out, this is when, you know, there's light and heat everywhere. Just like when we, the things that we believe, the higher truths we believe, they really seem obviously self-apparently true. And God seems like a presence who's there, or, or even if it's not uh, perceived as tangibly God, you still, you feel comforted. You feel like you have hope. You feel like things are going to go well. However, when it gets to be night, we don't have that anymore. You have the moon, which is bright, but it's dimmer and it's, it's not warm like the sun is. So Swedenborg says that that is an image of what he calls faith, or this idea that we have concepts that, that tell us things. Like obviously when you're writing this question, you know that there's the concept out there that God is stronger and God is helping, but it doesn't feel true, but it, we can still remember that it's true. We still can intellectually say, oh, that's true. That's like having just the moon, which is a little bit of light, but not heat. So if we can think of it like that, instead of what's wrong, but just to realize it's night, it's night right now, and I have this intellectual concept that, that evil is not stronger than good, that God is this force that can help, and that's what I can go on until it's morning. Because something implicit in the, the, this idea that there's a day-night cycle is that it'll end, the night will end. When you get into these little boxes of despair where your ego, or what Swedenborg would call hell, is trying to convince you this is where it's gonna stay. This is the beginning of the end and this is how it is, but knowing, oh, it's day, night, like even though it's dark now, it's gonna end. That takes all the power out of it for me, just knowing that there's gonna be this period, but the sun's gonna rise. So that's tool number one. Tool number two is that hell always lies. Hell is always telling you a lie. The evil and falsity are constantly linked. And hell is, in my experience, what I would call hell, this negative part of your ego mind that is trying to insert these debilitating concepts and convince you of them, they're always operating, hoping you don't question their assumptions or their underlying worldview, because what they're trying to get you to believe doesn't make sense if you step back from it and look at it. Because in that, the question you write, it, you're saying, what if God is not as strong as hell? Well, a worldview in which you be, do believe in God, but believe that an evil force is stronger, that doesn't really make sense because I'm, I'm assuming that, that uh, 
you don't believe in like a dualistic system where there's an infinite force of evil and an infinite force of good and is one stronger than the other. That, no, that God is the source of things, right? And that if evil was really stronger than good, we'd all be destroyed long ago, right? Or that how, that how could there be a source that would create structured beings that would live and love and all that, but then evil get what, like evil, they became stronger. What I'm, you know, you find your own reasons, but what I'm saying is it doesn't hold up to the, to the rational test of, in the, in the assumptions that are leading up to this little God is not stronger, right? So they're, they're always, they don't have a consistent worldview, but they don't want you to examine that. It's like, don't fact check us. Don't fact check us. They're, they'll use your concepts. They know you believe in God. They know that you believe in good and stuff, but they don't, they don't really hold up to those themselves and they're not putting them in the right order. They don't even really believe in this stuff that they're telling you. So I feel like if you can take the time to just step back or write down, wait, what would need to be true in order for this to be true, you'll start to see that it's, it's ridiculous. It's self-referentially ridiculous. But they, they just want you to focus on the little box at hand, which is you don't feel good, this isn't gonna work. They, they, don't, want, um, they don't want examination, they don't want um, to be, as I said, fact-checked. And then the last one is that this is how we grow. Swedenborg says that only through what he calls spiritual struggles, sometimes it's translated as temptations, do we progress spiritually. And he says that those categorically lead to despair. So one thing you can think when you're in the depths of some kind of despair like this is, even though I can't feel it, I know this is accomplishing something good. That, that the forces that are trying to convince me that I'm miserable and that I'm collapsing, there's nothing out for me, they're actually losing in this moment because this cycle is happening and the divine is strengthening me because in those moments when you realize your dependence on the divine or how much I need there to actually be that powerful, loving, present God, you actually form a closer bond with God. So you're gonna come out of this, they're gonna lose territory on this. They're, they're coming in trying to mess with you, but actually it's a bad time investment on their part that, that you're gonna come out stronger. So those are three tools to hopefully provide some comfort when you're in it. Uh, sorry that you're feeling like that. Know that we all do at times, or at least I do, and I, and I think the two of us are not the only ones. So that's, that's what I have to offer. Thanks for the question. So Jen asks, what is meant by the meek shall inherit the earth? So this phrase, the meek shall inherit the earth, actually shows up twice in the Bible. So there's three main words in this phrase, meek, inherit, earth. And um, so I'm gonna go through those. The earth, Swedenborg says, means the church. Um, and so, because in the Bible, it often talks about the earth in balance with heaven. So heaven and earth, heaven and earth, this and that. And so the earth is um, the counterpart to the kingdom of heaven. So you have angels in heaven, and then you have the people who are connected to heaven on this planet, in the world, in the created universe. And that is what the earth means. But to take it a step further, it really means the church is uh, a state of mind. It's a part of you. You can connect to what it means to be the church Swedenborg says in Apocalypse Revealed 285 that when the earth or land is mentioned, angels, being spiritual, do not think of the earth or land, but of the human race dwelling upon it and its spiritual state. And its spiritual state is the state of the church. And so then also this idea of the church being not a group of people or where you can sign up for membership, but really access in your own self to to the Lord's love and wisdom. Um, in Arcana Celestia 6113, also called Secrets of Heaven, um, Swedenborg writes, a person is a church when goodness and truth are present in him or her. And groups of such people make up the church in general. So that's the earth. Um, so then inherit, what does it mean to inherit the earth? And you can kind of get that already. If the earth is a state of mind of being receptive to the love and wisdom that's flowing in from the Lord, inheriting the earth means coming into that, um, opening yourself up to that possibility in yourself. So then we bring ourselves to meek um, and that the meek shall inherit the earth. What does it take to inherit the earth to be able to open yourself up to heaven. And it is meekness. Um, and another word for meekness is humility. And that Swedenborg says that we need that in order to 
allow for the Lord's love and wisdom to flow into us. Because for as, as long as we're thinking that we don't need any help, that we don't need, that we're self-sufficient in ourselves, we're not going to be receiving that into us. We need that humility in order to open up to this goodness from the Lord that the Lord is offering us all the time. And Swedenborg says as much in Arcana Celestia 2327, he says, So far as the heart is humbled, so far the love of self and all the evil therefrom ceases. And so far as this ceases, so far good and truth, that is charity and faith, flow in from the Lord. And another quote, which just says it really well, from Secrets of Heaven 4956. When we are feeling humble, we are in a state receptive to goodness and truth from the Lord. And that is what it means that the meek shall inherit the earth. And so just to bring it to the Bible, because this is where this phrase exists, in Psalm um, 37, I just found it really interesting that the whole Psalm, and I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's kind of long, um, really is teaching all of these spiritual elements to the meaning of that the meek shall inherit the earth. You could almost use it as a mantra because I think this Psalm is speaking to a state where when we particularly notice ourselves being overcome by evil and falsity and we feel weak to it, meek, recognizing that that's actually a state in which the Lord can give the earth to us, give the church um, this love and wisdom to us, that can really help us when we're feeling overwhelmed. So I recommend read Psalm 37 if you're feeling overwhelmed. The Psalm starts with talking about It says, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So that's an acknowledgement that that is something that comes from the Lord, not yourself. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. Um, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. All of this language that is this acknowledgement that goodness and truth comes from the Lord and not from ourselves. He says, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. So when you're in that negative state, wait on the Lord, and you know that you're going to receive that love and wisdom from him. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. So that state will pass. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. When we're like brought to our knees and having a hard time, perhaps think of that phrase, the meek shall inherit the earth, because you're not, the Lord knows that you're going to fall, that you're in this, you're having a hard time but that that state of humility is actually this key to being able to acknowledge that, you know, all this goodness and truth comes from the Lord and we can open ourselves up to that, to the Lord's mercy and compassion um, in, in those moments. So here's a question from Rain Lion Zero. Based on Swedenborg's view, what kind of prayer can be considered as the best or the most effective prayer? And what's the best time place, words, and method for prayer? Very, very interesting question to me. And I would love to know the answers myself. You know, what's the best time, place, words, and method? How should we be praying? Uh, Swedenborg, interestingly, is much more interested in where are we coming from? What is the state of our heart? What's the state of our life in our prayer? Let me start with a rather striking example where there are some spirits who are actually complaining to Swedenborg in the spiritual world because they feel like their prayers aren't answered. This is Secrets of Heaven 4227. They argued with me about the Lord. And then it quotes, It's surprising that he doesn't hear the prayers we pray, that he doesn't help his supplicants, they said. You can't be heard, I was allowed to answer. Because what you're aiming for is contrary to the well-being of the human race. You're praying for yourselves at everyone's expense. And when you pray that way, heaven closes up. Because in heaven, they pay attention only to the goals of people praying. The spirits did not want to acknowledge this, but couldn't answer it. It's like totally shut them up. (laughs) Well, that's kind of amazing. So he's saying that what heaven is looking for, it's not, are you in this physical position or did you say those words or whatever? It's sort of, where is your heart coming from? What's your goal? Why are you saying this prayer? Swedenborg talks in another passage about the difference between piety and caring. 
piety being all those external actions that we take, and caring being the attitude of our heart. So this is in New Jerusalem, and this is uh, from section 124. Piety is thinking and speaking reverently, giving ample time to prayer, having a humble attitude when we pray, attending church regularly and listening attentively to what is preached, observing the sacrament of the supper several times a year, and performing the other ceremonial acts the church prescribes. A life of caring, though, consists of having goodwill toward our neighbors and doing good things for them, basing all of our actions on what is right and fair and what is good and true, and applying the same principles in all our responsibilities. In a word, a life of caring consists of being useful. This kind of life is the primary way to worship God. A life of piety is only secondary. This means that if we separate the one from the other, if we lead a pious life, but not a caring life at the same time, we are not, in fact, worshiping God. Let me hit pause there and say, that's a very striking statement. You're not actually worshiping God. It's sort of what Swedenborg had to say to those spirits, isn't it? It's like, well, the way you're doing it doesn't really work because you're not coming from the right place. We're not actually worshiping God. Swedenborg goes on. We may be thinking about God, but this comes from ourselves and not from God because we're constantly thinking about ourselves and not at all about our neighbor. If we do think about our neighbors, we regard them as worthless if they're not like us. Further, we are thinking of heaven as our reward. So our mind is preoccupied with self-love and taking credit, being actively useful is something we either neglect or regard with contempt. And that's also how we treat our neighbors. Yet at the same time, we believe there's nothing wrong with us. That shows that a pious life apart from a caring life is not the spiritual life that is needed within our worship of God. Kind of amazing and cuts close to home sometimes. You know, the thought of, you know, we're not really thinking about other people if we're regarding others as worthless, if they're not like us, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. You know, I, I see that in myself. I see that around me in, in the world sometimes. That, you know, that, that's, that's powerful. And I notice in that quote that Swedenborg says that it's setting the bar pretty high, but he says, our prayer should come from the Lord. It should be coming from God, not from our own sort of lower self. Just like, well, I want this, I want that. So amazing what Swedenborg says, what you want is against the whole human race. I mean, that's pretty astonishing. Uh, hopefully our prayers are not that bad. But what does it mean to come from the Lord, our prayer to come from the Lord? Inflow must exist within every single part of worship. Those who have no knowledge of the secrets of heaven suppose that worship begins in ourselves since it flows from the thoughts and feelings within us. But worship that begins in us is not true worship. Consequently, offerings of thanksgiving, adoration, and prayer which begin in us are not the offerings of thanksgiving, adoration, and prayer that are heard and accepted by the Lord. They must begin in the Lord present with us. It's so mind-boggling. You know, what is he talking about? Then he goes on to say, the church knows that this is so, for it teaches that no good thing emanates from us, but that everything good comes from heaven. That is, it begins in God there. The church, therefore, when engaged in anything holy, prays that God may be present, giving guidance to our thoughts and words. What happens in all this is that when we are engaged in true worship, the Lord flows into the forms of good and truth that are present in us, raises them toward himself, and raises us with them in the measure and degree that we are governed by those things. This raising is not apparent to us if we have no real love for the truth or for what is good, if we do not know, acknowledge, and believe that everything good comes from above, beginning in the Lord. So how I take that statement is that part of what we're doing when we turn to prayer 
and other forms of worship is that we are trying to get in touch with what is of heaven in ourselves to try to get in touch with that love or our desire for truth and those sorts of things and then be able to pray from that level. So unfortunately, Swedenborg doesn't really tell us, you know, what's the best time of day. He talks about the fact that when we first wake up, we're in a relatively heavenly state and that kind of thing. And so we can determine that that might be a good time. Uh, as for the place or the words or the method or whatever, Swedenborg is more interested in what's going on in our heart. And in an interesting way, if we asked him directly, like, okay, you know, what's the best kind of prayer? He might say, well, what kind of life are you leading? How are you treating people today? Because that will affect how good your prayer is. He says that quite directly sometimes. That's how good our prayer is. It's only as good as we are. So I'm going to be answering two questions uh, together. And the first one is from Eric. Some religions believe in miracles, but do miracles really come from heaven? And do these inhibit the divine design or what a person is supposed to follow? And the second question is from Lawrence. What about being able to have supernatural powers? Are the miracles of Jesus possible to do by anyone? Um, also so curious about magic. So the first thing that Swedenborg is really clear about with miracles is that they are not outside of the divine design. So Swedenborg talks about in True Christianity number 502 about God's omnipotence not being outside of the divine design. So he says, it's not outside the divine design. God himself is the design because all things were created by the design, in the design, and for the design. So there's this sense then that um, the divine design is not created by God's imagination per se, it flows out from God's nature. And therefore, anything that God does, including miracles, must be within the divine design. What's also interesting about how Swedenborg talks about miracles, though, is that he has this sort of beautiful reverence for the natural world. You know, he is, of course, a scientist and interested in, in all the ways that the world manifests itself. And there are some passages where he talks about just natural occurrences, silkworms, bees, all the intricacies of nature, and he calls them miracles, and he speaks about them with awe and reverence. And so I think that's really interesting way to look at it. You know, you have this continuum then of things that we see every day, and these are miracles according to the divine order. And then you have other things that may seem different from what we expect, and these are on sort of another end of a miracle continuum, but they are also arising from the divine order. What Spinball doesn't tell us, though, is what's going on in the spiritual that precipitated what we understand to be a miracle. He doesn't say anything about what spiritual changes or differences happened that made um, an earthly effect that we would then call a miracle. We as people though, still also exist within that, this divine order. We have our natural earthly embodiment, we have our spiritual aspects. And so as to the question of being able to participate or engage in miracles ourselves, you know, we know that there is not necessarily um, a separation between the spiritual and the natural that, you know, that uh, we are part of the order that has spiritual flowing into the natural. And we know that there are ways in which the spiritual affects the natural. There have been studies that show that a spiritual life means having um, health benefits, you know, um, and we don't exactly know how that happens, but we see the effect of the spiritual flowing into the natural. So, you know, is, is having a more healthy life a miracle? You know, we, I think we can think about it in that way. Swedenborg invites us to think about it in that way. But as to um, the miracles that Jesus does, that seems like a pretty high level <laughs> um, 
connection to the divine order of spiritual flowing into the natural. I think we human beings are pretty far away from that kind of um, miracle work. But um, the other side of miracles, though, that Swedenborg talks about is how coercive they can be. And he points out that if our faith isn't already developed by rationality, that any kind of faith that is created by seeing a miracle is only going to be external. That the order of things, right, spiritual flowing into the natural, um, governs our spiritual life as well. That the Lord is supposed to flow in, into our internal. And then that manifests into our external. And that um, things that affect our external faith can only be temporary and, um, and ultimately, he calls it persuasion and not faith itself. So, so he, he makes a point to say that miracles cannot create faith for us. They can confirm faith, faith that is already being created by um, rationality from listening to the word, but that miracles have a limited effect in creating faith for us. So while it's interesting to think about, you know, whether the miracles literally happened and how that might have happened, it's also really interesting to think about the psychology of miracle. And now we're back to this whole continuum idea. Because what we call a miracle has as much to do with what we expect to be happening as not. And, um, and so if we are seeing something that is called a miracle that is demonstrating to us a sort of power beyond rationality, power beyond explanation. You know, this kind of miracle is what Swedenborg calls coercive and not something that is helpful to the development of our faith. But a miracle that is understood to be already a part of the divine order that we have accepted as being true and, and part of God's will for, for the whole of creation, then a miracle in that context confirms our faith and enlivens and empowers our faith. I'm really sort of charmed with the idea of reclaiming small miracles for our lives, like reclaiming, as Swedenborg does, this idea of the miracle of all the tiny things that we see around us. And in that way, these kinds of miracles can um, be a continual force for developing and growing our faith. Audrey asks, was Swedenborg a follower of Jesus Christ? He refers to the Lord, but I wonder how he viewed Christ. So the short answer to the question is yes. Um, and it's yes to a high degree. And the Lord is just a term that he uses because Jesus is Jehovah manifest in the flesh. So he uses the term Lord in the same way the Old Testament uses the term Lord. And I make that statement with confidence because um, within new church ideal of Jesus and God and the Trinity, there is a Trinity, but there's only one person of God as opposed to three persons of God within Orthodox Christianity. Um, meaning body, soul, and preceding action. That's where the Trinity is. If we even look at the name Jesus Christ, um, it's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Yahshua or Joshua, which means Jah saves, Christ meaning Messiah. So literally Jesus name means uh, Jah, the Messiah saves. Um, so when we take that into consideration, um, John 1, 1 through 14, where it speaks of um, the word, the word being from the beginning, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. Um, also, when Jesus himself says that um, he expounded all the things in the Old Testament concerning himself, um, which means uh, that the whole Old Testament was about him and its deeper meaning. We all know, whether you're Christian, Muslim, atheist, or agnostic, that it's impossible for an a finite created mind to understand what it is to be infinite and eternal. So in order, but it is possible to understand the relationship between the infinite and eternal and its creation, which is the human race. 
to use an analogy, if um, we if a drop of water approaches the ocean, what happens to the drop of water? It becomes consumed by the ocean. It's no longer a drop of water. It no longer has anything of its own. It's part of the ocean. Same thing with anything that may from the earth that might try to approach the sun. Once it gets near it, it becomes consumed by the sun. Um, and it's the same thing when the finite tries to, anything finite tries to approach the infinite, it becomes consumed. We kind of read that in the Bible too, how everybody drops as if dead when they approach God. So in order for there to be that conjunction and that presence and that unit union, um, the infinite has to appear in a form that is adapted to human reception. In a word, that's Jesus Christ, um, that one person of God. Um, and the Trinity are three attributes of God. Um, so when we look at it from that perspective, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's logical and it makes sense. Um, now, to take it a step further, say for instance, we have this bottle of water. I'm being Curtis right now. <laughs> um, and um, so, the infinite fills this bottle of water with all of its essence, that water inside. But with Jesus, the plastic that was around, that surrounds and made the water um, approachable without being consumed by it, actually became divine too. It became part of the essence of the water. It had all the attributes, which is the difference between Jesus and any other person who may be filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, so to speak. Um, so not only was the water um, divine and the infinite divinity, the bottle became, and Jesus became also. And there was a process for that, which we don't have time to go into um, right now, but you can read all of that in the writings. Um, so another thing that, uh, that made the question really good is, is when we look at Swedenborg in life, we see all the elements and all the complexities and that's what is brought forth and they're explained. And when we also look at the life of Swedenborg, Swedenborg and also people, I like to use like the difference between Emerson and Keller. Um, Emerson was a studier of the writings, but he wasn't a new church. Helen Keller was a studier of the writings and she was a new church. Another example is Henry James and his sons, Henry James Jr. and William James. Um, Henry James was a new church, but his sons were uh, familiar with the word and took a lot of elements and things into their philosophical writings and their art form. Um, so that's the significant difference um, in uh, Swedenborg being a follower because the difference between a follower of Swedenborg per se and a new church is the Lord, Jesus Christ. Um, and that was something that I understood because I, uh, because I started to read the writings, study the writings, and I was getting all the, the morality of it, the love and wisdom issue, all of those essentials, all of that truth. But yet for many years, the Lord wasn't the focal point. So the distinction is when the Lord becomes the focal point, you go from being a follower of the writings of Swedenborg to a follower of the follower of the Lord. And then you go from the process of just using those things in your own way to being a new church and, and going into the process of reformation and regeneration, um, which is I use that just to to state how Swedenborg most definitely himself was a follower of Jesus Christ. So. Long answer, short answer, yes. Jean, or maybe Jean, asks, I love that you have shared that Swedenborg said not to judge others' paths, yet I find myself judging myself very harshly as I try to become more spiritual. Any thoughts on this? Yes, I do have a lot of thoughts on that. I really resonate with this question because it's something I've struggled with myself a lot. Um, most of us are our own worst enemies, our own worst, harshest critics. So welcome to the human race on that one, you know. But uh, by divine design, we are born self-centered 
and it's a long journey out of that. Somewhere along the way, I realized that self-centered or self-love does not only look like arrogance or conceit or like power control or selfishness. Self-hatred can be just as self-centered as self-love. And that was a big thought for me and it just helped me step away a little bit from this sort of obsession about my own worthlessness. Um, so now when I get into that kind of vicious cycle, one thing I try is just uh, getting to work on something useful, even if it's just washing the dishes, to sort of break the cycle, br stop the thoughts and break the cycle of that, you're no good, you're no good. Another thought is a question for you. Is it actually you doing the judging? You know, Swedenborg talks about how there are always hellish forces at work with us. He refers to them as evil spirits. Curtis calls them head bullies. My high school teacher called them the basement boys. Uh, but they would always love nothing more than to attack any kind of spiritual progress or any growing relationship with God. So your effort to become a more spiritual person is, you know, attractive to them uh, in terms of making you wanting to make you feel bad about it. Uh, there's a passage in Secrets of Heaven, number 5386, that talks about spirits who love to burden the conscience of simple, good people, revving up the doubt and angst they are feeling when they're worrying about something. And it says that it is those spirits that actually cause that feeling of anxiety in the pit of your stomach, which is wowish, you know. <laughs> Um, so if you find yourself having harsh judgment about your progress, I would say check your spiritual neighborhood because, you know, angels would be inspiring feelings of courage or hope or resolve or commitment. But if it's anxiety and judgment that you're feeling, you know, maybe there's some basement boys, some head bullies hanging around on the street corner and you can dismiss them. I, I find it helpful to just say out loud, I see you, you're not welcome here. And that sometimes just changes the state. Another thought is that Swedenborg does talk about the importance of self-examination, as he calls it. Um, it's good to reflect on your intentions and your behaviors and to ask the Lord's help in bringing them more in line with the heavenly mindset. But obsessing about it is a problem. Swedenborg says that taking a deep look at yourself just once or twice a year is sufficient to maintain an upward progress. So if you're the type that is uh, into self-flagellation, you can put that flog down. <laughs> and it is your intentions that count. Uh, Married Love 523 says, it is the thoughts of our heart or the purposes of our will that judge us. So when I get clear about my intentions in some arena of spiritual work, and I just send up a prayer for help, for help in staying on the path and for protection from obsessing about it. And God does want to help us. There's another marriage love quote uh, from 529 that says, as soon as a person has the goal and commitment to abstain from any one evil because it is a sin, he or she is held by the Lord in the purpose of abstaining from all other evils. So God is pulling for you. In fact, somewhere near the beginning of Swedenborg's published works in his work, Secrets of Heaven, it talks about how the Lord is totally in charge of our spiritual progress and our spiritual development. And immediately I get the image of a fetus in utero, which is beyond, you know, the meddling hands of human beings. And wow, what if we just surrendered the whole spiritual development process to God, to God's hands like that? But later works do talk about the essential value of refraining from hurtful behavior. And in his last work, True Christianity, we get an outline of the steps of repentance that we can take to progress on our spiritual journey. And I have a friend who's developed a whole process about this. And if you check out the website, beginanewlife.info. There's lots of help on just going through those steps in arenas that you would like to improve in your life. 
Lastly, there's a passage in Marriage Love 523 again that says the quality of our inner minds or souls and therefore what our spiritual state is and what our lot after death will be is known to the Lord alone. So not even we ourselves can know everything about our spiritual state. We can't even be, have a clear view on our own motives all the time. But God is love itself, says Swedenborg and wants us to be in a mutually loving relationship with the divine. And in fact, Swedenborg says that although we're free to opt out, we are all destined for heaven. So you've got spiritual gravity working for you, as it were. <laughs> um, so I would encourage Eugene or Jean just to hold yourself gently in the process, invite the Lord into the process, and let the divine guide you into enjoying the ride a little more. So Lady Grace asks, why is it that you sometimes meet someone that you've never met before, and yet you feel as though you know them? Is this to do with your past life? Very interesting question. What Swedenborg would say about this is that he says, actually, the past life thing is not uh, that's not actually accurate to what's going on, uh, that we're sort of one and done, I call it. We live here once, then we go to the spiritual world. That makes the situation even more mysterious. What is going on? Because we have that experience sometimes, don't we, where you encounter somebody and you feel like, I know you. Sometimes you even feel like, hey, it's you. You know, and the other person says, it's you. You know, the first time you ever meet. So what's going on in that situation? Swedenborg does talk about that, and he even talks about his own experience. He doesn't talk a whole lot about his own kind of emotional experience, but he does in this particular case, that at least he describes this phenomenon in Heaven and Hell. In section 44, he says, Kindred souls gravitate toward each other spontaneously, as it were. Now, I take that as it were to mean that it seems like, whoa, it's just random coincidence that you bumped into this person. But there's actually a kind of spiritual gravity that's drawing you together. For with each other, they feel as though they are with their own family at home, while with others, they feel like foreigners, as though they were abroad, meaning in some foreign country. When they're with kindred souls, they enjoy the fullest freedom and find life totally delightful. Then it goes on to say in the next passage that it is the Lord who gathers these people together. He says, it is not the angels who gather themselves, but the Lord. So the Lord brings people together and people who are similar. So the, the Lord is the real cause behind this phenomenon because he knows who you are. He knows who the other person is. He said, this will be fun. Let's have you meet each other and see what happens. And then Swedenborg explains <clears throat> that in the spiritual world, this is particularly pronounced, you know, where people are in their essence and you can really see who people are. So he says in section 46, people of similar quality all recognize each other there in the spiritual world, just the way people in this world recognize their neighbors and relatives and friends, even though they may never have seen each other before. In the spiritual world, this happens to two people never seen each other before, but I recognize you. You're part of my clan. I've had this experience in the flesh in the sense of like I've met cousins. You know, when we were grown, you know, the, he grew up in Phoenix. I was over in England, you know, and we never met each other. And then we meet when we're, when we're in our 20s or something like that. But you you're you're my cousin, aren't you? You know, like you, you recognize the people. Swedenborg says, this happens because the only relationships and kinships and friendships in the other life are spiritual ones. I've often been allowed to see this when I was in the spirit and therefore out of body and in the company of angels. Then some of them looked to me as though I had known them from infancy, while others seemed totally unfamiliar. The ones who looked as though I had known them from infancy were the ones who were in a state like that of my own spirit, 
while the unfamiliar ones were in dissimilar states. So I think what's going on when you meet someone and you just think, oh, come on, like, I know you, you know. Uh, what's going on, I think, is that the Lord is gathering people together and what you're seeing there is something in the spirit that's similar, a similar love, a similar approach to life, a similar sense of humor, a similar understanding. And I'm interested that Swedenborg says that with those people, you can enjoy the fullest freedom and find life totally delightful. All right, that's our show for today. So if you feel like you got anything good out of the experience, please like and subscribe. That helps us get out into the, the YouTube universe and hopefully somebody else who is asking these very same questions in their heart uh, finds this and, and, and gets the same kind of help-ish that, that you got. And if you want to make this channel work, if you want to be part of the engine that gets this uh, whole thing moving, right? Engines move things. Consider joining us on Patreon. Thanks so much to everyone who's done it. Patreon is a way that you can be supporting us in an ongoing way, and we can be connected with you more. You'll be getting great behind-the-scenes perks, including this week we had Dr. Jonathan Rose delving deep into the first editions and showing you how Swedenborg, where and when he was repeating things and how he was editing and how through that his thought progressed. Fascinating stuff. And uh, just a little thank you from us to you uh, for the support. So go, go check it out. And we're going to see you next Monday for uh, another show. And that show, oh, right, I almost forgot. It's going to be about colors, the spiritual meaning of color. So we're going to delve into what does Swedenborg's experiences tell us about these shades we see all over the world. So I hope to see you then. Thanks. Swedenborg and Life is Amy Aquarola, Morgan Beard, Curtis Childs, Karen Childs, Matthew Childs, Alexa Cole, John Connolly, Cara Dom, Chris Dunn, Stuart Farmer, Ben Keyes, Reed McArdle, Chelsea Odner, Jonathan Rose, Shiloh Silverman, and Shada Sullivan.